I want to celebrate something before I get into the message today. I asked you last week if you'd be willing to sign up for a daily reading plan, and so far we have almost 800 people who have signed up for this daily email to read the scriptures day in and day out. You still have a chance to do that on the back of the program. There's a link for our website. It's just suncrest.org slash subscribe. Um, you can go there and sign up for it if you'd like. But here's the point. You know, we're doing the book of Acts all summer long. And we decided to start the reading with the book of Luke because Luke, of course, is the, the prequel, if you will. Probably it's more appropriate to say the Acts is the sequel to the book of Luke. But just as he's told the story of Jesus, he then picks up and tells the story of what happens after Jesus. And we're reading all that together. It's fantastic. So the passage that I'm going to teach today is a passage that I've taught more than any other passage in the Bible. Isn't that crazy to think about? I've taught it many, many times at Suncrest. I've taught it on four different continents. I've taught it not only in sermons, but I've used it as the basis for commencement speeches that I've given, for ordination uh, commissionings that I've done. I've had it as the basis for conversations with marketplace leaders because it's a beautiful picture of vision and of strategy. But maybe even in addition to all the crowds that I've talked to, I've treasure the times when I've talked about this passage in a living room with other people or in a staff meeting with our leaders or just with someone who's trying to figure out what in the world they're supposed to do with their life. If you know what this passage is about, it's, it's about the primary mission Jesus gave to the church, so you wouldn't be surprised that I've taught it more than anything else. I mean, it's basically my job to teach people how to follow Jesus according to the scriptures, and this verse embodies it better than any other. It's basically my job to lead a church that would boldly take on the mission that Jesus has given us, and I want to make sure that we're doing that. So we sit in this passage all the time. This passage is the reason for our mission at Suncrest, to be used by God to change lives. This passage is the reason for our vision at Suncrest to impact one million people over the next 20 years. This passage is the reason why I do what I do. This passage is the reason I look at you like you're crazy when you tell me you won't serve for an hour every week. This passage is the reason that I'm not afraid to ask you last year for $2 million to expand this facility, and it's the reason I'm not going to be afraid to ask you in the future again. This passage is the reason that Jenny and I became licensed foster parents last year. This passage is the reason that we drive a van that has about a quarter million miles on it, so we can keep being as generous as we can be to the things of God. This passage is the reason that this was my favorite picture from last weekend. This is a lady named Jody in our church. She invited her friend Kelly at Christmas Eve, and she came. And then Kelly had to sort through some things of faith. She was not a follower of Jesus, but she came to what we call starting point, this environment where you can, can figure out what it really looks like to follow Jesus. And then Jody kept her to keep leading her to trust God, and then last weekend in our 1030 service, she baptized her. This passage is all about the people of God being stronger than hell and tougher than nails and changing the world. That's what this passage is about. But before I get to the specific verse that is the mission of Jesus for all of us, it's interesting if we, we kind of pick up where we left off last week, you'll remember Jesus was resurrected. This is about six weeks after his resurrection. He's told people that they actually should wait for a little bit until this transition from him to this wild and fascinating power called the Holy Spirit was about to come. But before he could announce what his mission is to people, to this crowd of about 120 people who are up on the, the Mount of Olives just outside of Jerusalem, he comes up on a conversation that they're having with each other. And this is that conversation. So then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Now, there's a lot in that question. I'm going to talk about it in a moment. But part of it is that, that people still had this picture of what Jesus was about that was incorrect. They missed the idea that this was about God's kingdom and it was about reaching the world. Instead, they thought it was about kind of a political takeover of the, the Roman occupation that the, Israel, the people of Israel were currently enduring. Jesus, is this the time that it's going to happen? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. So before he gets a chance to announce the mission, I, I think this little bit of a conversation here um, is actually a cue to all of us. And what it's cueing us is that, hey, if you're going to follow Jesus and you're going to be involved in carrying out his mission, um, it's going to be, let's just say, uncomfortable for some people. 
In fact, I think there's three things that happen in this conversation, and we should all identify with them to say, things are going to be a little uncomfortable for people who are prone to three different things, and chances are you're prone to one or more of these. The three that I'm going to describe, I'm not suggesting that they're inherently evil, but I am suggesting to you that if you're going to embrace the mission of Jesus in your life, you will have to adjust yourself away from them. And so here's kind of three phrases that I hear that, that you'll, they'll make you uncomfortable if you're prone to these phrases. Here's the first one. What's in it for me? I mean, in some sense, this is what the people were asking Jesus. Hey, Jesus, we've been following you. It feels like it's been a little bit of a, a sacrifice so far, so we're waiting for the payoff. Right? Is this the time, Jesus, that, that now all those who are in power over us, like you're going to just knock them out and we're going to be the ones in power? Are we going to get things the way we want them to be? I mean, there is this inherent selfishness that we all have to admit is inside each of us, and it comes in direct conflict with following Jesus and carrying out his mission all the time. There was a consumer version of Judaism and these people had it pretty embedded in them. Say, hey, I'm, I'm willing to do a little as long as I get the payoff in the end. And of course, there's a consumer version of Christianity. And it's alive and well in America. Where people have spiritual experiences or maybe church experiences. And the, the main question they're asking is, does this meet my needs? Is the, I'm kind of in it for me, Right? It's so funny to me because I talk to people all the time about decisions we're making around here, and, and people will say things to me like, well, I don't like how we do this. I don't like how we do that. And usually when they say that, I'm not a rude person, but usually when they say that, I just say, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. I, I'll ask them the question. I say, well, do you, do you think it maybe helps us accomplish the mission better? And sometimes it's like they had actually never thought about it that way. Honestly, that's okay. That's just how you should think about it because... Like, there's things we do around here that I don't like the way we do them. But it's never about personal preference. It's never about what's in it for me. That's a, that's a whole consumer orientation to God, to Jesus Christ, and to some sense the church. And if that's your orientation, you're going to be real uncomfortable with the mission that Jesus is about to give us. Now, to be fair, I, I noticed over a period of time, people would say things like, I don't like this, I don't like this, I don't like this. And I'd say to him, I don't care. I thought, you know what, just to be fair, I'm going to start when people come up to me and they'll tell me things they like. They'll say, hey, Greg, I really like this. And you know what I'd say to them? I don't care. Because <laughs> I, I don't care if you like it or if you don't like it. That's not the grid we're trying to figure out here. We're trying to figure out how to accomplish the mission. All right? That's, that's just the idea. It's not, it's not about what's in it for us. There's another thing that uh, will make people uncomfortable. If, they, if people want to say, hey, let's talk about the end times a lot. That's essentially what was happening when Jesus happened upon this conversation. They're saying, Jesus, how, how's this going to work in the end? And Jesus had to tell them, it's not really for you to know the, the, the times or the dates, things like that. But, I mean, you probably know people like this. Maybe you're one of them. Even to some degree, I'm one of them. I'm kind of fascinated about how's this going to work at the end of time. I think maybe we should do a sermon series or a Bible study or something on how the end times are going to work right? It's a fascinating subject, right? But I'm pretty sure that if Jesus was in your small group and you said, hey, let's do an eight-week study about how the end times are going to work, he'd say, actually, let's just go for eight weeks and go serve somewhere instead. I'm 100% sure he'd say that because that's what was happening at the Mount of Olives. People wanted to speculate and talk and kind of run all the theories and try to, and he said, look, look, that's, not a, that's not actually a helpful conversation. The point is the end times are coming, so let's go get to work. That's the mission in front of them. One more phrase that's going to bother some of you. There's a group of people, by personality actually, who have a personality that says, I need to know how it's going to work. Um, at the extreme, people are OCD, right? I had somebody tell me once they were actually CDO. I said, I'm so OCD that I have to put them in alphabetical order in order to... <laughs> to describe what I'm really like, right? Now, some of you aren't OCD, but, but you kind of have this in your personality. You think, um, I'm willing to go with you as long as you can explain everything to me about where this is going to go, right? This is a personality trait that, that again, it's not evil, but it's really tough to reconcile it with faith. A posture of trust that says, even when I don't know everything, even when I can't figure out how it's all going to work, 
I'm still going. What did Jesus say when they said, is this the time? Jesus said, actually, it's not for you to know. It's not for you to know. I had someone I respect once who, who I was talking to him about this in my life, and like, hey, I, I said, you know, I, forgot, I just kind of wish there was a map, right? Like for my next five years, if there was a map and I could see where all this is going to lay out and then I could do this and do this and do this, I wish there was a map. He said, well, if you trust the guide, you don't need a map. Well, that's true. If you trust the guide, you don't need a map. If you trust the one who knows what the future holds, if you trust the one who's already got a vision for you, in fact, it's possible your guide is not telling you what the future holds because you can get there, but you wouldn't think you could get there if you knew what the future held. I mean, this is how the scriptures describe us trusting God all the time, right? What does he say? The, the scriptures are a lamp unto our feet, right? A light unto our path. They'll show you what your next step is. But if you need to have this picture of how it's going to work over the next year, the next five years, how it's all going to end up and be confident it's all going to work out, following Jesus doesn't work that way. And so if you're a person who's prone to say, I got I to gotta know how it's all going to work, it might be that Jesus is saying to you tonight, it's not for you to know. This is about a trust relationship with the guide, not about you having it all mapped out. So this is kind of the pre-conversation that's happening before Jesus gets to his statement, his sentence about what the mission is for people who are followers of his. These are the very last words that he's going to speak on planet earth before he ascends into heaven. And this is what he says. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And one of the things I think about when Jesus cast this great vision for the 120 or so people who are, who are listening to him, I think, were there any eye rollers left? Were there any people like, there he goes again. The dreamer, the guy, he's off his rocker again. My guess is probably not. I mean, they're standing in front of the, the person they saw crucified six weeks earlier. And at this stage, if they believe in the resurrection power of God, then when Jesus says, I actually have a mission for you, I really mean it. This is going to be dependent on you trusting God who is coming to live inside of you. You will have to represent me wherever you go. And then as you go, we're taking this thing global. Because every single person on planet Earth deserves to know of the grace of God and His love for them. And it's not going to be cool for you to take this consumer posture, or for you just to speculate about the future, or for you to have to have everything figured out before you take any step at all. Because the mission is too important. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. Can you imagine standing there? We're on the Mount of Olives. He gives his final mission to them, but very real sense to you, to me. And he ascends into the clouds. He finishes this way. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? Now, if I'm one of the people standing there looking into the sky, I'm like, no, seriously, you got to give me 10 minutes here. <laughs> right? Like, this doesn't happen every day. He went in the sky. Maybe he's coming back down. I don't know. I like, like, but even the angels, the messengers from God who are around them, in the moments after Jesus ascended, the angels essentially said, all right, it's time to stop just looking up. Let's go get to work. And I want to challenge you this weekend with a let's go get to work sort of message. I want to ask you whether your posture and your 
sense of following Jesus is a let's go get to work posture. Because I don't want to be the one who's caught just staring into the sky. I want to be the one who tackles the mission that Jesus himself gives us. So let me just flesh this out a little bit. What is the the Jesus mission? Well, there's three massive parts to this, this beautiful sentence, this beautiful mission that he gives us. So the Jesus mission, um, I'm going to work it actually from, from end back to the beginning, okay? Where does it end up? It ends up with a vision, a vision for us, and that vision is to change the world, to change the world as we know it. Jesus outlines it in this way. He says, all right, we're, we're just outside of Jerusalem. You're getting ready to go back there. Change Jerusalem. But it's not okay to stay in Jerusalem. Outside of Jerusalem, there are regions called Judea and Samaria. And guess what? The place called Samaria, that's where you don't like to go. It's where people are different than you. And it gets uncomfortable. It's where there's racial tension. All your jokes are about the Samaritans. But I'm actually telling you the mission that I gave you is not one just to go back to your house and hold on to. It is to go beyond your comfort zones. And just to be clear, it's not just to Judea and Samaria. It is to the ends of the earth. Now, over these 18 weeks this summer, we're going to see this take place. The book of Acts is the story of this happening. It starts in Jerusalem, it goes to Judea and Samaria, and then it goes to the ends of the known world, the ends of the earth. But this reminds us, it reminds you of something about your mission in this world. It means it can't be self-centered. It means that even collectively as a church, it would be anti-Jesus mission to say, just make sure you're taking care of your own. Instead, it is something that is beyond us. It changes the world. And this is one of the reasons the mission statement we have at Suncrest is we want to be used by God to change lives. It teaches us what the end goal is. The end goal is transformation. We don't want people to stay the same. We want them to experience this transformation in God. And for whatever reason, God gave us the mission to do it. And so the whole idea is that every person in our church, all 1,500, 1,600 of us, would say, yeah, I'd put myself in the positions where God could use me. I'm trying to change the world. When I share with you that our vision as a church is to impact one million people over the next 20 years, sometimes I wonder, are there any eye rollers left in the crowd? A million people, Greg? Really? 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 How are we going to do that? It's a good question. <laughs> We're going to do it by being a church that is devoted to starting new churches that start new churches that start new churches. And so far, we're at tens of thousands. And out of the 1,600 people who were here last weekend, my guess is there's 16 of you, 1%, who ought to be one of those people who goes to start a new church. I don't know if you've ever thought about that for yourself. I mean, it's quite possible the only way you've thought about your life is to think, well, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable in suburban Chicago, but comfort isn't the, the metric. My guess is there ought to be 160 of us, 10% of us, who one way or another are engaged in this mission beyond Suncrest. That when we announce to you where our next new church is going to be and you have the, tr- the chance to transfer from Chicago to Indianapolis or sh- from Chicago to San Francisco or from Chicago to Florida or from Chicago to Paris, that you just think, you know what, maybe I'm supposed to take that transfer. Because I'm actually part of something here. I would think in such large terms that I want to be about this impact in the world. For most of us, 1,600 of us, what every one of us has to do is build a great church here. 
that's worth reproducing and engaging the people who are far from God around us? This is the mission that Jesus gave us. It's huge. Beyond that, there's an identity for us. It is about our relationship and responsibility. The way that Jesus phrased it was, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. You'll be my representatives. You'll be the ones who have seen and experienced the work of God in this world, and then you'll let it transform you in such a way that you go and do the work of God in this world. You will do it with a power because you understand the resurrection power of Christ. You won't be afraid because you know that God has power even over life and death. You'll just go. And it will be centered in a relationship with God. It's not just about doing a list of things. But it absolutely will not stop with a relationship. It is a relationship that is overwhelmed by what God has done for us. And says, God, if that's who you are, then I'm going to go. And take my responsibility. I'm going to adjust my financial life. I'm going to adjust the way I spend my time. I'm going to adjust the relationships that I'm invested in. I'm going to adjust for the sake of the mission. It's relationship and responsibility. This is one of my favorite parts whenever people come to our gathering we call Welcome to Suncrest. It's a, it's a great gathering. Um, you can come even if you're not new to Suncrest. It's just a great place to kind of learn about the church and figure out some places to get connected. But I always have this little talk with people who come to Welcome to Suncrest because um, one of the things we try to do, of course, at Suncrest is create an environment here where people who aren't believers or aren't connected to church would feel welcome here. We value excellence. We kind of roll out the red carpet for, for everything that we do. And it could be possible... It, if all you've ever experienced is a weekend service at Suncrest, that you think Suncrest is actually designed to make you a consumer. But for people who come to Welcome to Suncrest, I always gently announce to them that um, this is what I call the, the transition moment. You know, where you came in and you experienced God and you placed your trust in Him and you, you grew and and you were actually kind of an object of God's mission, right? He was coming at you with his love and his grace and his relationship with you. It's, it's beautiful. But then there has to be this, this point where you raise your hand and accept a demotion and say, hey, I, I know. I know Suncrest was focused on reaching me, and they did. And I know who God is. This is fantastic. But now instead of remaining as the object of God's mission, I became a partner in the mission to reach the next group of people. And so instead of rolling out the red carpet for you, I'm going to ask you to roll out the red carpet for the next group. That is the embodiment of saying, I'll be your witness. I've seen what you've done in my life, and I want to do everything I can to bring that about in other people's lives lives. It's relationship and responsibility. About at this point in the talk, I usually find that people are shaking their heads with me like, yeah, that makes sense, Greg. Yeah, that's, that's big goals. It used to be about big goals. I, I, maybe I need to step up a little bit, but, 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 but I don't feel like I'm prepared. I don't feel like I'm ready. I don't feel like I'm strong enough. But I don't feel like, but I don't. And I think that's the reason for the first line of the statement. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. See, this is, this is a power that is for us. But of course, it's a power that ultimately is beyond us. The calculation for the person who's the follower of Jesus is no longer, how smart am I? It's no longer, what am I capable of? It's no longer centered in my own capabilities. Instead, a whole new world is open. What did Jesus say to us last week? 
He said when he was in the upper room with his disciples, I'm going away, but one is coming so that you can do the things that I've done, so that you can do greater things than Jesus. Why? Because this transfer from the presence of Christ physically with people to the Holy Spirit coming on them is transformational. I don't know if you know this, for essentially all of the Old Testament, all the time leading up to this moment, the Spirit of God was present. It's always been part of what we call the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the Spirit of God would would hover. It would be present within crowds. It would move things in certain directions. But something was going to change, and it's going to change in the message next week. The Holy Spirit is no longer someone, something, some being, God Himself, who just his hovers and, sh- and shifts. And do- Instead, the Holy Spirit decides, God decides, the Holy Spirit will come and live inside of you. That doesn't make you God, but it gives you the power of God. That doesn't make you divine, but it gives you divine direction. It makes you a person who's no longer afraid to take risks. It makes you a person who no longer has to know how it's all going to work. It makes you a person who you can hear from God. He can prompt you and you can follow His promptings. It makes you covered with the Holy Spirit. You embody the Holy Spirit. This is God himself living inside of you. I have a little brother. He's kind of a math wizard. And he went to college to be an actuary. You know what an actuary is? It's a nerd. (laughs) It's my interpretation of it. He works for State Farm Insurance at their corporate headquarters. And he spends all day running all these calculations, right? He's trying to figure out, you know how to take the variables out of things. He, like, Excel, like, he just loves it. Some of you love Excel. And the thing that would drive him nuts the most in an average day at work is if there's things that are unpredictable or variables. I guess that's good if you're an actuary. I'm not an actuary. I'm a pastor. And almost completely opposite of my little brother. I'm not trying to eliminate the variables. I'm depending on them. When I sit across from someone who's preparing for their marriage or trying to repair a broken marriage, and I don't have the perfect words to say because I almost never do, I'm relying on the power and the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, to prompt something, either through my words or directly in their heart, something that would cause them to forgive one another in a way that's supernatural. When I'd say, we're going to tackle plant in seven new churches this year, there's not some plan where you can calculate all of that for exactly how it's going to work. I I am depending on the variable. The variable being the power of God. The variable being a calling on someone's life that they're willing to answer and go and reach into a new place to establish a new sense of Christ's mission in some city around the world. It's not a calculation. It's not predictable. It's the Holy Spirit. Because you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And that's what makes it possible for you to be His witnesses. Where you are and wherever He sends you. If you live your life in a way that is fundamentally predictable, if you can calculate every decision, and you decide, I'm not going to take any risks... Why would you do that? If you're a follower of Jesus here, I am asking you 
to arrange and construct your life in such a way that you depend on the power of the Holy Spirit. You take risks you would otherwise not take. You leap with faith when you don't quite know how you're going to land. That when the Holy Spirit prompts you, when you're convicted about something, you'd say yes even when it's hard. And fundamentally that you would organize your life not around comfort. Not around comfort. And that fundamentally you would organize your life not around security. And that fundamentally you would not organize your life around yourself or even around your nuclear family with your kids and your grandkids. But instead, when the Holy Spirit would come on you, that you would be His witnesses where you are and wherever He leads you to go. I want to pray for that right now. God, your word says that we should not quench the Spirit. That it's possible the Spirit speaks and it prompts and that we snuff it out, we push it down, we quench it in some way. But God, given the opportunity to be involved in the work of your kingdom in this world, Simply give us the posture of yes. In Jesus' name, amen.